Hey guys, welcome to the Beast Lab. In the studio today, a conversation with Taylor Cummings, arguably the greatest lacrosse player of all time. We're going to discuss her path on strength training, how she approaches the game, and then in the post game, we're going to get into a couple extra things, including her stance on the equality in sports and how she's been at the forefront for it. Can't wait for you guys to listen. Okay, welcome to episode one. Greg Renlin here with the Beast Lab. I have Taylor Cummings, one of the greatest lacrosse players of all time. She was a McDonough legend and All-American. All she went to the University of Maryland where she had a historic career, was an All-American there, an NCAA champion, and a two-time Tawaraton winner. If you don't know what the Tawaraton Award is, in football, the Heisman Trophy is the Tawaraton of football, just so you have an idea. And then she was also a gold medalist with Team USA. Now she plays professionally. She coaches lacrosse full-time, and she's the head coach of our alma mater, uh, historic power, McDonough. Taylor, welcome to the conversation. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to chat with you. Yeah, this is great. So what I want to do is kind of dive in, have a conversation. The reason we're doing this Beast Lab is because I want to bring strength training knowledge as well as athletic experience all to one venue for people to digest. What I want to do is just kind of give me a little bit of a background on how your philosophy started when it came to training when you were younger in lacrosse. So for me, I was really fortunate to have a local gym that my mom actually trained at um, with her friends that started to work with a middle school age group um, that, you know, just focused on running mechanics and basic lifting and a lot of injury prevention. So I probably started quote unquote working out um, like sixth or seventh grade. And for me, and the, I was so fortunate to have great coaches that weren't about, you know, me lifting crazy heavy amounts or putting a ton of load on my body, but just really getting that fundamental and foundational base, um, how to run, how to lift, how to do so safely and effectively for my sports. Um, and from there, you know, I just kind of, um, continue to get more comfortable in the gym. Um, I played three sports growing up. So high school, I was a soccer player, a basketball player and lacrosse player. So once I entered high school, I didn't have a ton of time to get, you know, lifts in and runs in, but I had that fundamental foundational base from, from middle school and kept that going when I could through the summer and, and my off season, um, up until college, I, just was really fortunate to have great, great coaches who understood the importance of hitting the gym and the strength and conditioning piece. Um, and just really found myself really enjoying it the older I got. Yeah. And that's actually a really refreshing thing to hear. When you look at the guy side of things, it's usually like, Oh, I learned how to lift because my older brother's big and he taught me to start doing bench press. Oh, and by the way, my shoulders hurt all the time. Yeah. So the fact that you started from an injury prevention standpoint, you said your mom, your mom owned the gym or ran the gym? No, she, um, she did like the group classes with other moms. So <laughs> instead of us sitting in the waiting room, we actually got, they actually started opening up, um, like middle school training. And, um, that was, you know, both a time, a time killer and also just got us excited to, to move. No, that's smart. And for those people at home trying to figure out why is Taylor coming so physically dominant, uh, it looks like it's in the genes. Started early. So thanks to mom on that part. Uh, well, you talked about the injury prevention part, which is really interesting to me. When you look at injuries, um, how has your, your story uh, with injuries gone throughout the years? Because now I'm interested to hear about that. So knock on wood, I've been pretty fortunate um, to not have anything major happen. I've broken a lot of bones um, in my hands and fingers in particular when I was playing basketball and, um, you know, rolled some ankles and, you know, had a lot of broken noses and facial bones, but thankfully nothing ligament wise or needing surgery. So I I'm very fortunate. Um, I think that is a testament to, you know, the work I've done throughout the years in the gym to make sure that, you know, my body can handle the, the turning and the intensity and the aggression. Um, but I also think it's a real benefit of playing multiple sports. Um, so I'm not using the same mechanics and movements time and time again, um, going from soccer and basketball to lacrosse, um, you're just using your body in a different way. And that load and that strain is, is on different muscles. I'm still moving, but it's different movement patterns, which I think 
saved me from having some really catastrophic injuries, especially in high school when I was still doing a ton, um, but just in a different, different way. Yeah, and I think that's when people talk about, I know a lot of college coaches say all the time, we want multi-sport athletes. Um, the problem is, is then we're recruiting these kids in fall ball during other sports. Uh, but that's a, that's a conversation for a different day. However, I think you're right. Like for face-offs, for instance, for us, our low backs, shoulders, and wrists are going all the time because no one is designed to do this 500 times a week. And I think being able to throw the stick in the closet, I beg my guys all the time, throw your stick away and just go do something completely different for a couple of weeks. And I think you're right. Even though you are training and you're playing an aggressive sport, because it's completely different uh, biomechanics throughout the year, I feel like it makes you a better overall person uh, lacrosse-wise uh, and athletic-wise, but also it, it stops you from that wear and tear because basically our bodies are a tire and we only have so much tread. Um, exactly. Now, when yeah. you look at... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go. No, no, this is all about you. you. Um, yeah, I mean, I just think for me, you know, you hit on it too right then and there. Like, you're doing something different. You're happier. You're a better person, but you're also just a better athlete. I think you just learn different things. You get coached by different people. Um, and that just in turn helps you lacrosse wise tremendously. Yeah. And then looking at, cause I totally agree with you when it comes to the actual, um, rest and recovery, right? Did you have a, a appreciation for that early or did you start to develop an appreciation for that as you got into college and the pros? definitely it's still a battle um rest for me has always been a battle but definitely a growing appreciation as i've gotten older um you know for instance we just came off a of u.s weekend there are 19 year olds 20 year olds out there i'm 27 and a half um so i've started at the younger end with my u.s career and now i'm towards the back of the the line for for oldest to our youngest to oldest and um you know for me having worked with Jay Dyer for so long, he has really instilled the importance of recovery and both tapering off before a training weekend and also that taper off after, before we start to ramp up again. And um, I know like I couldn't perform as well over the four days as I need to, if I was going, you know, balls to the walls leading up to it. So that has been something that I've had to learn and fight throughout my college years. Um, you know, I struggled with over exercising, under eating in that point in my life, I was definitely not resting, um, to, you know, have to find the balance so that I can play at my optimal, my optimal, you know, level when it matters. Yeah. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, Jay Dyer is going to be a constant name that gets brought up in my mm -hmm. conversations. In fact, he is scheduled to be one of our guests in the coming weeks. Uh, one of the mainstays of lacrosse training uh, when it comes, especially to the USA players. We all know Jay very well. Um, so when you talk about your traveling through your career now from a, from a training standpoint, started through middle school, how did things start to change the way you looked at your training in high school and then in college? High school, um, for me, training was very centered around what sport I was in. Um, so my soccer training was more endurance based, um, you know, having to be able to run for, you know, I think our, at that point in time, our halves were like 40 minutes. So 80 minutes at a time, um, making sure, you know, that's a little more like you're jogging into sprinting into jogging again. Um, when I got to basketball, it's much more start stop. It was a lot of footwork. It was a lot of shorter sprints in a tighter space. And then lacrosse was kind of that hybrid of as a midfielder where I needed that endurance piece, but I also needed to be able to sprint. So the timeline of my, the sports I played would work out pretty effectively where I felt like I was in really good shape. Um, but still able to do those quick movements for dodging for, for def defense and, and lacrosse coming off of basketball. And then once, you know, I got into college, um, I played for a team where, you know, I didn't come out of a game and, you know, that's awesome. But I then needed to be able to play for 60, 70, 80 minutes if we went into overtime and play the same at, you know, three minutes that I could play at, you know, minute number 57. So for me, my, my focus went from more sprint work and then more kind of 
compartmentalizing it more endurance and then more sprint work to kind of finding that balance during the week where I'd focus on distance, you know, outside of practice. And then when I was at practice, when I was with our strength coach, it was more sprint based workouts so that I could last an entire game playing midfield, but still be explosive and, and dominant and have the quickness that I needed when I needed it. Um, so that was, you know, going in freshman year, I, you know, I kind of just did what our strength coach told us to do. And then I slowly realized that if I needed to play the entire game, I was somebody who needed to put in the work with distance and making sure that I had that endurance piece. And so everyone was a little different in how, and how they responded to that. But for me, I knew if I wanted to play the entire game, I needed to have enough gas left in the tank at the end, which required me to, to work on that distance piece, which wasn't my strong suit. You know, and it's interesting because I want to ask you about your strong suit as well. The first thing I wanted to make a comment about is there are different types of college athletes. There are the types that just get through it and they just they train because they have to. And then there are the types that have careers like you did where it's not a coincidence that there was a low injury rate. There's not a coincidence that you were so physically dominant. It's because you were trying to learn about the strength and conditioning as you went and you started to understand the value and that helped you. I feel like when you go through your workouts like it's busy work and you don't understand why you're doing it, it's really hard to get through it, especially at the Division One level when you're walking to that strength training room and you just see where the weights are and you know you're in for it that day. Um, now, I'm, I'm a natural sprinter, so the face-off position was perfect for me. When I would train, I'd always go for sprint endurance. So I would try to do a short work-to-rest ratio for 20 to 30-yard bursts. And like you said, I wanted to be as good on my first face-off as I was in the fourth quarter on the last one. So as somebody who, are, are you saying that you were a little bit more natural of a sprinter and you had to learn to understand the endurance piece? Absolutely. I remember going into my freshman year of college, my dad was like, you should go on longer runs. Like you need to get in better distance shape and trying to crank out like two, three miles was difficult and it was mentally and physically exhausting. And um, you know, it's just something that I had to learn and it went from, you know, learning to just suck it up and do it to actually learning to enjoy it. And now like distance running is where I do a lot of my thinking and a lot of like my, just like, it's my me time kind of where I can kind of just, just think and throw on a podcast and go for a run. Um, but I was very much a sprinter. I was very much short bursts. I could crank out, you know, any kind of sprint workout easily, but doing things distance took a lot of practice. Um, and it took me forcing myself to do something that I didn't necessarily like or want to, but knowing that it would have a huge impact for me on the field and keep me on the field. And that's what I wanted. Yeah. And I think when people ask, this is a perfect opportunity to kind of get on the soapbox about this for a second, because people ask, I'm sure you get the question all the time. How do you stay motivated? And, and the reality of it is we're not always motivated. Uh, we have to do things that we hate. Sometimes we do things when it's freezing cold out. The question really is, is it worth it? Is what you want worth being uncomfortable that that moment? And for you, you made the conscious decision as a natural fast twitch short burst sprinter to learn to love long distance, which I will admit at the age of 37, I have never done. Um, I would fail a five mile test, but I'll tell coach, I'll outrun anybody you put me next to for a short uh, distance. So it takes a lot of mental fortitude to do what you did. Um, so when you look at what I'm really want to hear about, because I think this is important for people to understand variables, you went from playing three sports in high school, like most of us did. And at the age of 16 and 17, you can be in shape for the next sport within a week or two after coming right off of your last sport. When you got to college and now you're playing one sport and you're training for it year round, tell us what the mental difference was for you, because I think there might be a lot of incoming college freshmen that are going to listen to this conversation. Mentally, what does that do for you when you're only playing one sport year round? I have to admit when I, my freshman year, it was really hard for me to not be playing soccer in the fall. Um, soccer was the first person, was the first sport I picked up. Um, I played it since I was six and to not have soccer in the fr my freshman fall was like a, a wake up call in a bad way. It was just that weird, weird feeling. Um, and I think for me, what I had to learn quickly my freshman year, both training wise and social wise is balance. 
And um, I was not balanced my freshman fall. Um, I went out a lot. I ate a lot of bad food. I also was lifting crazy heavy. Um, I had trained all summer prior in the gym, came in really strong, but perhaps not as fast as I had, as I was in the spring. And so I quickly had to kind of relearn the fact that I'm somebody who puts on muscle really, really fast, but it doesn't always make me faster. And so for me, it was that balance working with my strength coach after my freshman fall of, okay, I can go squat, you know, 230 pounds, but do I really need to? And is that going to actually be benefiting me come spring? Or am I somebody who maybe needs to lift a little bit less, go higher reps, keep my explosiveness and not pack on as much muscle to then be able to, to move the way I needed to. So I think for me and the best advice I can give is just kind of finding that balance and having the honest conversations with, with your coaches. Um, now, if you go in and say, I don't like to lift because I don't want to get big, then that's a different story than, you know, I don't feel as, as fast and strong and explosive as I need to. And so having that conversation and that open discussion was really important to me, but it was all about the balance and figuring out that one, I needed to, I, I did need to lift. So finding that, and then two, there was going to be times that I needed to put in work outside of practice. That wasn't just strictly lacrosse based that I did need to go on extra runs that I did need to make sure that on Sunday mornings, you know, if I, I, I got up and got myself moving and prepared for the week. So that's what worked for me. Um, and it took a long time throughout my freshman fall to, to figure that out. No, that's great. That's actually phenomenal information because I, when I was a strength coach, that was, that was my first career. When I was a strength coach out of college, I remember the number one talking point that every new female client would give me is I don't want to lift weights because I don't want to get too big. And, I, and every single female that I would meet thought that they were this special unicorn that would put on 40 pounds of muscle if they did one squat. Uh -huh. But then they would hop into spin class and they would do hours of resisted quad work. And it was always interesting to me. Um, so you're right, having that conversation of, I don't want to lift weights at all is not going to go well with any Division One strength coach. <laughs> but having a, a strength coach, what, what was the, the Maryland strength coach when you were there? Mike Zimborski. He's now with the Notre Dame basketball women. Okay. Yeah. I mean, having somebody like that who is willing to have that conversation with you and has the ego to step back and, and do what's best for you as an athlete is really important. Um, and it shows in his trajectory with sports. Um, so when you, as you got through into the college realm, tell me now the difference between being a college athlete who is training every day for that to then jumping into the USA realm where now you're graduating, you have to stay in shape from a USA perspective and from a pro lacrosse perspective? Yeah, that I think what, you know, made training in college so much easier and also more fun is you're with your team, right? You're in the weight room, you're on the field sprinting next to each other. Yeah, you're in a crappy workout, but you're doing it alongside your teammates. So you have that, that pull to kind of do it for them while they're right next to you. And I think the hardest part once I graduated and the lesson that I learned quickly on was that you have to do a lot of work by yourself now. And so I was lucky that I'd gotten somewhat into a routine where, you know, I did train by myself in college. I wasn't always team oriented, but now you're going from like a 15% alone, 85% together to now you're like 95% alone, 5% together. That was hard. And finding that balance out of college, I feel like you know, every college athlete, when you first, that first year coming out, at least for me, I kind of banked on the, the lifting and the fitness I had from that spring through my 2017 world cup. And I graduated in 2016. So for like a year and some change, I kind of was like, okay, I feel like I'm, I'm okay. I don't need to lift like crazy. It's residual. And then afterwards, I, that's when I went up to Jay and was like, I need to actually be lifting and running and with somebody who can put me through a program that I'm not just going to the gym and doing whatever I want. Um, because whatever I wanted was not going to help me stay quick and fast and explosive. Um, 
so I, it took me about a year and I watched other people graduate and go through that same, that same sort of year cycle. And then you're like, Oh God, it doesn't last forever. I need to kind of get my butt back in the gym. If I want to play at the level that I want to play at. And, um, you know, it's just interesting being five and a half years removed now seeing it happen pretty much every year to people. Um, and feeling like you're now in a good space where I, I do have a routine down and can work by myself. Um, so that when I do get to us or pro I'm excited to be there and you know, it's a, it's a treat as opposed to, you know, being alone. Yeah. And you're right. And that, I remember telling, I think Brian Carolunas this after his first year with me at the lizards. And I was like, look, I know everything I need to know about you as a teammate. When you come back your second year in training camp, do you take this seriously as a professional? which is, it was harder back then because we were certainly making even m- less money than we make now. Um, mm-hmm. But if you want to stick around, you have to do that. I think the understanding of strength training, everything about training is about progression. And in order to do that, you know, you have the, the staple of progressive overload in strength training. If you don't have somebody making you do that extra rep, or you don't have somebody making you do slightly more weight, or cutting your rest periods, or forcing you to go and progress, like you said, with a program, If there's no substantial way to progress, you end up doing the same workouts over and over or skipping workouts or, ah, I don't have time for this extra thing. I got to go. And now here you are as two, three, four years out. Why am I, where's my burst at? You know, and then at the same time, you're getting older. So I've always said, like, if you stay exactly the same as an athlete from day one to day two, but you got older, you technically got worse. Um, And, you know, I, I certainly felt it as a, what was I, 30? 35 years old, 36 years old on Team USA. And I got Trevor 12 years younger than me, like <laughs> laughing and smiling through the running. Like, you know, it, there's a lot of pressure there, uh, especially, yeah. you know, with when you have a name like yours, people have an expectation and you've done a great job of continuing to push that. Um, so when we go further down the line now, you are the head coach of McDonough, right? And you are at your alma mater. First, I just want to hear how special that is. And then I want to hear how has your journey with training produced your philosophy as a coach and training your athletes? Well, first of all, I mean, coming back to McDonough was so special. Um, I started as an assistant in 20, oh gosh, 18, I think. And, um, you know, going back to a place that I loved my experience at, um, was awesome. You know, my teachers were now my coworkers, which was a bit odd, but, um, other than that, it just kind of felt like putting on riding a bike. You just, you got right back into it. And, um, this is now my fourth year as the head coach. And, um, I work with great, you know, great staff, um, great assistants. Our kids are so locked and dialed in that, you know, it makes coming to practice every day, especially for high school, you know, easy. Um, you don't have to worry about their commitment. Um, I think for me, you know, I've been so fortunate to take so much of what I've learned from the amazing coaches I've had, um, and tried to like funnel that into who I am as a coach. Um, but specifically with like training, um, I encourage our kids to be multiple sport athletes. Uh, we only have like 70 girls per grade at McDonough. So we need them to be multi-sport athletes, but as a student, I saw the benefit of it from a mental, physical, emotional standpoint. And I want that them to have that same experience as, as students themselves. Um, but I also think, you know, having them, I encourage them to rest and to take breaks. So we don't do a ton of lacrosse in the fall. Um, we don't do a ton of like crazy indoor leagues or, you know, a ton of practices in the winter because I truly see the benefit of taking time off of playing other sports, of putting your stick down and just sitting on the couch every once in a while. Um, That balance, you know, they're playing so much more lacrosse than I did as a high schooler. I played two high school, I I would play like two or three fall tournaments, three or four summer tournaments, and that's it. Maybe go to one camp and then I was done until high school season. And now there's so many things that kids can do, which is awesome, but it really makes, that balance piece and that rest period non-existent for them. So I try as a high school coach to, to keep them from honestly playing as little across as they can, as far as McDonough's concerned in the off season. Um, and then, you know, they're working with Jay now. So our program's working with Jay. 
Um, I'd rather them, you know, be in the gym, lifting, getting the correct mechanics, having somebody watch them who's a professional um, so that, you know, come, come the spring, they're ready to go and compete at the highest level. That's awesome. And, and it's awesome to hear your refreshing take on it too. I feel like the power struggle between club and high school and trainers is always very real and it always puts the kid in an awkward position in between everybody. So the fact that you understand that balance is huge uh, for them from a, an emotional standpoint, not just a physical standpoint. The, the fact that Jay Dyer is training your athletes now is incredible um, from an injury prevention standpoint. Lucky. Yeah, yeah, Jay is the man. Um, so not only are you the head coach at McDonough, but you also do your own camps and clinics, right? So get, yep. tell us a little bit about how you balance your own strength training as a professional athlete still, being a head coach, and also your camp and clinic business. It's a lot, um, but I think, you know, as college athletes, you and I learned the value of time management and organization. So for me, it's just really important that I carve out that time for training. Um, and for me, that's in the morning. That's when that works for me. So every morning, you know, I get up five, five fifteen, whatever it is. And I get my workout in I either drive to us lacrosse and train with Jay. Like I did this morning, I do it on my own. Um, and then I can shift my focus to, you know, my kids and, and what they're doing. So I feel like for me, they wouldn't get the best version of me if I didn't get my own training in because I'm somebody who just feels like the itch all day if, if I haven't gotten it in. And so it's just about balance for me. It's about making that time for myself. I would love to be somebody who slept until, you know, eight or nine o'clock. I'm just not. And um, that's because I get up and I train and that makes more sense to me. And that's something that's really important to me. And it's my, my me time before I go focus on the kids I train, my team, um, anything else I have to do throughout the day. Yeah. And I can understand that Jax knows here at home, daddy has to get his workout in or daddy gets grumpy. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so with the Cameron clinic business, your head coaching and your strength training, um, your entire legacy as an athlete, I feel like we can really go back. And I love the fact that we started with that middle school. You started to learn the value, not just of injury prevention, but also strength training, what works best for you. Um, if you were to give us a quick breakdown, because I'm sure some listeners want to know, what would your schedule training wise be if you had to tell us um, in season compared to off season, what would your daily training look like? Like just kind of like a snapshot. So I probably in season and um, we'll just talk like it, right now we're preparing for World Cup. So this is a good, a good glimpse. Um, we just got done an October session. We have a November session. We have a January session. So right now we're sort of in like a keep it peak and maintain it as much as possible from October to November to January. As you know, it's somewhat a little hard. It's hard when they're spaced out like this to remain in peak shape throughout um, so between October and November, it's really that maintenance piece that rest and then like a quick ramp up. So I'll probably lift, I lift with Jay, lift and run with Jay twice a week, um, like heavy Olympic style. I'll probably get, you know, two lifts on my own in throughout the week. Um, and then I'm probably running four days a week. So some days are run and lift. Some days are just lifting. Some days are more running focused, but um, that's kind of my balance and that will be sort of how I am from October or probably September through January, trying to maintain that as much as possible. And then my guess is once our early January session hits, I'm now technically in like off season for a few months. Um, so that's where we'll probably taper down, probably go through some eccentric, uh, eccentric work with Jay um, take a little rest. Like I've, I've pretty much been go, go, go since our AU season in August. So January will be the first time I can really take a couple weeks and sort of go 50% and then build back up. Um, and then probably around April or May, that's when I'll start ramping up my, my conditioning, ramping up my, um, lifting to make sure I'm, I'm keeping that explosiveness and in prep for June world cup. That's awesome. Well, Taylor, I want to thank you very much for giving us this breakdown. I think people can learn a ton from this. Uh, just give us real quick where people can follow you, both for your clinic business and on social. Um, my Instagram is Taylor Cummings underscore. Um, I also have Taylor Cummings lacrosse that has all of my training 
um, information. And then taylorcummingsacross.com has all of my, my signups and registration for anything clinic wise. So that's where you can find me. Awesome. We're going to move it to the post game after this, where I'm going to talk to Taylor about her professional season last summer. And we're also going to get into a few other things that are going to be a little bit off the wall. So if you are a premium subscriber, you can stick to that. I'll see you guys in a little bit. For the regular subscribers, thanks a lot for listening. Taylor, have an awesome day. Talk to you soon. Thanks so much.